Before we get started, because because the Kluge River Aboriginal Art Collection is um, the only museum devoted to Indigenous Australian art outside of um, Australia, we um, start every program by acknowledging um, Indigenous people. So we just want to acknowledge that the Kluge Roo, um is located on the land of the Monica Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And since we are broadcasting from um, locations around the world, um, I want to acknowledge all of the indigenous nations where each of us are located. And I encourage you, if you don't know who those nations are, that you find out and that you learn more about them and their culture. So welcome to the first webinar in a series called The Art in Life, which is a partnership between the Kluge Roo and the Fralin Museum of Art, both art museums at the University of Virginia. Um, we as university museums are investigating art forms that don't typically show up in the museum for a variety of complex reasons. Um, we felt that there are all kinds of art forms that are culturally dense and deeply tied to identity and formally and technically complex that really deserved our attention. And so, um, and really because these are often taken for granted, um, because they're part of our daily lives, um, they're not kind of set aside in the same way that fine art often is. Um, they often aren't labeled as getting the same kind of attention or deserving the same kind of attention as uh, paintings or sculpture or other forms of fine art. Um, and just to give everyone a sense of the timeline of this program, um, each speaker is going to talk for three to four minutes about their own relationship with uh, tattoos as a medium. And then we're going to have a few questions um, from us moderators to open up the discussion and then we'll open it up for um, the live Q&A at the end. I think that's everything. So I'm going to hand it over to Lisa to introduce herself and our first speaker. Oh, Lisa, I think you might still be muted. Hi. Oh, now I can hear you. Good. We're good. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Again, um, my name is Lisa Javak. I am the assistant to the director and special projects coordinator at the Freeland Museum of Art EVA. Um, and we love partnering with our, our partner museum here at UVA with the Kluge Roo. So we're really excited to be doing these programs, especially virtually. And I am also very excited to have these four tattoo experts speak with us this evening who are literally joining us from all over. Um, tonight's panelists are talking with us from Pittsburgh, Texas, New Zealand, and one even from right here in Charlottesville. Uh, and this is one of the things that we found to be a perk of doing these programs virtually is that we can engage globally with our speakers as well as our audience. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker from San Marcos, Texas, tattoo artist and historian Sharky. Sharky is a tattoo artist who is Jersey born and New York City bred. Sharky's on the road approach to life and work have helped her to cultivate her take on American traditional tattooing for over 10 years. Heavy black, strong line work, and the ability to work within a variety of subject matter make up the sum of Sharky's style. Doom metal, occultism, and motorcycle banter come free with every tattoo. Her devotion to preserving the oral history of tattooing has played a major role in her upbringing in the craft, and she is always eager to share that information with anyone searching for the light of the torch. Welcome, Sharky. Hi. Thanks for having me. This is so much fun. Uh, yeah, I don't know how I could top the bio that I already wrote. That's it. <laughs> My name is Kimberly Williams, but most people in the tattoo industry know me as Sharky. And uh, I have been tattooing for a little over 10 years. And uh, I was what we call broken into tattooing in the American traditional vein, which essentially means that I follow a set of code, ethics, and a style of tattooing that originated in the late 1800s here in America. And just, I am trying to 
perpetuate those ideas, that style, that image, and that way of being onto the next generation. We just, we tend to think of each other as links in a chain and we're strong. You're only as strong as the other link to carry it forward. Um, I work in San Marcos, Texas now at Classic Tattoo. Um, and we consider ourselves medicine men and women of tattooing there. Uh, we carry, we keep these little eyes of the medicine man. Everybody gets them tattooed on them when they get a job at that shop. And we take tattooing very seriously. And uh, the responsibility that comes with it to be a person who puts these things on people, regardless of how serious or, or silly they are, uh, we feel that there's a great deal of responsibility on the artist's shoulders uh, to do the right thing by the client, even when they don't necessarily know what that right thing is. We're there to guide. And that's it. Short and sweet. Wonderful. Yes. All done. right. Thank you. All right. So I would like to introduce our next panelist, John V. Wright. Uh, who is an avid collector and wearer of tattoos. Professionally, Jonavi is a beautician who has worked all over the country from Seattle to Chicago to Charlottesville. She loves people and their stories and also loves art in all forms from music to writing to sewing tattoos. And on a personal note, I can attest that Jonavi is the best hair colorist in Charlottesville. So when you're ready to get out and get your hair done, I highly recommend her. Welcome, Jonavi. So much, Lisa. That's so sweet of you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I think about, you know, me and tattooing. It's funny because growing up in Seattle, I never was surrounded by people with tattoos, but I always knew that I wanted to be covered in them. Um, and it's funny, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know anyone, no adults. And then when I became a teenager, I was unfortunately gifted a tattoo machine, which fortunately was very short lived. <laughs> it was not pretty. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I grew up as a, a teenager, still didn't actually get any tattoos until I was 20. Um, and now 12 years later, I'm just kind of filling in space. And I mean, I feel like my relationship with tattoos is really, you know, people get them for all different reasons. And I feel like I sort of am that, in that same boat where Recently, I discovered and was able to acknowledge that some of the reason that I get tattoos are as like a way of like coping with traumas that I wasn't aware of as a way of armor, as a way to protect myself. And then on the other hand, it's an art and I appreciate getting art from these, you know, these, these tattoo artists that I follow. I travel and get tattooed by whoever I find on the internet, like thanks to Instagram nowadays. Um, and now I'm at a point where some tattoos I have don't mean anything. I have a hand calf. And you ask, what is a hand calf? And it is one of my calves is just covered in hand tattoos. So, you know, <laughs> I think that's it. Okay, well, thank you. All right. Um, now our third panelist, Sean Mallon, is of Samoan and Irish descent raised in New Zealand. He is Senior Curator Pacific Cultures at the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tangarea, where he has worked since 1992. His writings on Samoan tattooing include the co-edited book, Tatao Samoan Tattoo, New Zealand Art, Global Culture, and Tatao, A History of Samoan Tattooing with Sebastian Galliot, he recently curated the exhibition in 2019, Tatao, Samoan Tattooing and Photography. Please welcome all the way from New Zealand, Sean Mallon. Yoda, that's the um, greeting from the, the, the people of the land here, the Maori um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Talofalava, that's a Samoan greeting from the land of my mother. Samoa, which is an archipelago of islands right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So I'm really um, honored to be part of this panel and to thank you for the invitation to participate. I guess my engagement with Tatao with Samoan tattooing began when I was um, you know, under 10 years old and I saw a crooked band of markings on my grandfather's, my Samoan grandfather's wrist. 
and I, you know, banked that and wondered what they were and just tucked it away in the back of my mind. But as I um, got older and became, you know, pursued university education and worked in museums and became a, a you know, museum professional, uh, Samoan tattooing took on a, a greater meaning and it became one of the mediums of several through which I was able to um, look at the history of Samoan people and think about big processes like uh, they affect us all, like globalization and, um, you know, the commodification of culture and things like that. But also, and probably most crucially, it was a medium through which I could explore my personal identity and understand some of the issues facing a lot of people in the Pacific and Samoa who had, whose parents had left their homelands and had settled in other countries like places like California, the US, uh, Hawaii, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and um, the way in which tatau or tattoos in general operated as a very powerful way for people to connect to who they are and their, their heritage. And that's not the only way they did that. So like um, one of the previous speakers, I too have been tattooed and um, and uh, it's been a way for me to, tattoos have been a way for me to explore my own personal journey, but also to mark the many relationships um, and people I've met and places I've been as part of my um, my research and, and, and my study. And um, it's, uh, it's an ongoing journey. You know, I think people talk about how you become addicted to tattoos. <laughs> and I've certainly um, experienced that. And, uh, you know, I'm always counting my pennies and, and thinking about the next spot and the next artist or opportunity to be marked. Um, and uh, I think that will keep going as I, as I get older. And my son, for example, right now, I said to him, if you do 28 runs, that's five kilometers, 28 of them, I'll, I'll put away $10 for each run so that when when you do 28, you'll have $280 to go to get your first tattoo. So um, it's been a good way for him to lose weight um, and get a little bit fitter for basketball, but also um, a way for him to earn and think about, you know, what tattooing can mean. So it's, it's very much at the center of my mind right now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sean. All right, and now our fourth and final panelist is Pittsburgh na native Mark Parrott. Mark has worked as a professional photographer for the past 50 years. In addition to his commercial work, Mark has spent his life making photographs that document Pittsburgh citizens and its rich industrial landscape, documenting and publishing work on subjects that range from the steel industry to investigating state penitentiaries to tattooing. His most recent and fourth book of photography, Tattoo Witness, documents 40 years of Mark's portraits of tattooed Americans. Mark's photographs are included in the permanent collections of a number of museums, including the Carnegie Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Museum, the Westmoreland Museum of Art, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Welcome, Mark Parrott. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks to the Freeland. Thanks to Liz Wright for somehow putting this together in a nice way. It's great to be with us panelists. Um, I've made pictures lifelong here in Pittsburgh and driving to my studio and home every day 40 years ago, I would pass a tattoo parlor called Island Avenue Tattoo. And one day a voice said, stop the car. So I did, and I went in and met Nick Bubash, who was the tattooist, and watched as he completed um, some work. Um, and the whole experience was beyond engaging. So I asked Nick, could I come back on the weekend and start making photographs, portraits of people who just got their first tattoo? Because that was commonplace. And he said, yes. So I started there and moved on to Rust Belt, cities in Michigan and Ohio and New York and same MO, spend a weekend making portraits in tattooist studios. And then tattoo conventions came along and I chased conventions across the country to find subjects for my portraits. Um, in the early 90s, I went cross country trying to locate 
10 of the best known celebrity tattooists I could find. Uh, and it was during that journey I met Lyle Tuttle, um, who maybe some of these folks know and recognize. Uh, he was a celebrity tattooist who was on Johnny Carson. Um, and during my portrait session, I said, Lyle, why do people get tattoos? And he said, we're all searching for our lost tribe. So I've carried that with me. Maybe that's a part of it. Um, a few years ago, I decided to go back out um, and explore 65 year old and older subjects to see and to hear what motivated them and to make their portraits. And uh, that kind of wrapped up the experience that I've had for 40 years. The book was a part of that. Um, but I can tell you that um, every tattooist and every subject has been a teacher for me in wonderful ways, um, unexpected ways. And uh, the humanity of that has driven me and the mystery is still the mystery. So thank you. It's good to be here. Wonderful. Thanks to everyone for um, giving us a bit of sense of how you got interested or engaged in this topic. Um, and thanks to everyone for, I don't know, opening up your lives to us tonight. Um, we're going to start with a few questions that Lisa and I developed um, that we felt were really interesting. And the first one has to do actually with um, something, Mark, that you just kind of touched on a little bit, which is why, why people get tattoos. Um, and, you know, one of the things that art historians do with art is they think about um, the motivations. And, and obviously there are a lot of motivations for getting um, tattoos. Um, some are really deeply rooted in identity and experience and others are more sort of casual and more frivolous and spontaneous. Um, can we hear from each of you just about what, mo what, um, um, uh, about what motivations that you've seen in yourself or others for wanting a tattoo or many tattoos um, and the process of sort of selecting a design and what, and what goes into that process? And we'll open it up. Um, so speakers, just as a reminder, if you if you want to jump right in, um, you just need to unmute yourself. <laughs> I'll start. Oh no. All right, there you go. Um, so I believe that the motivations for people to get tattooed are varied and endless and eternal. Uh, it's interesting, Mark, that you mentioned Lyle. Lyle was a very dear friend of mine and a mentor of mine and losing him last year was terrible but that phrase that he said to you he said to everybody and I always keep that with me too it's we are looking for our lost tribe so it doesn't matter if you're coming in you know on a birthday they want a tattoo when someone dies they want a tattoo when someone's born when they see their favorite movie uh, uh, their favorite cartoon it's it's an endless, some of them are very serious reasons, some of them are casual, some of them are just silly, you know, somebody, you know, I've tattooed a loaf of bread on someone, just for the joke of it. It doesn't particularly matter. But at the end of it, it connects you to something and a group of people. And that's something that since the beginning of time, human beings have been looking for. And you know, the old adage is that the oldest profession is a prostitute but that prostitute had a tattoo. It's been around forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, people, I feel like are equally as driven by like beautiful experiences in their lives, like whether it's an event or something that happened or love or family or whatever else. But then there are also, I feel like so many tattoos that are driven by grief, you know, like, that in itself, getting a tattoo while you're grieving somebody is like such a therapeutic experience. And I have a few of them from like close friends that have died way too young. And, you know, it's really sad, but it totally represents like this amazing, it's like, a, it's a healing experience for sure. And maybe, you know, just as much as somebody have, you know, having a baby and getting a tattoo, that also is like this sort of like joyous experience. And tattooers are the ones that are experiencing all of those things 
And I think that that is what makes what, what tattooers do so special because you have to like actually give a shit about people and about like their life and what they're going through to be a good tattoo artist for sure. Well, um, the, the one thing that has amazed me um, is that as a photographer, I get to witness transformation, which is a rare moment in the life of all of us. And those moments happen, or at least that's what called to me early on at Nix was watching people wait, participate, and leave transformed into a different being as they walked out the door. Awesome. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Um, that's, you're absolutely correct. That's exactly what happens every single day in the shop. You nailed it. Yeah, all these, um, all the previous speakers' um, comments resonate with me. And while, while I am a researcher and historian of Samoan tattooing, which I guess for people in the tattooing world who know what Samoan tattooing looks like and what it represents, the, the most popular or widespread um, meanings are associated with uh, service within the community, um, uh, transitioning from one part of life to another, uh, a transformation in, in st social status. But beyond those very ceremonial and you know, highly reified cultural roles, Samoan tattooing also does other things, as other people have just said. They can help heal. Um, they can be a way of connecting with the past. Um, you know, uh, sort of jumping over or working through the processes of colonization and, and cultural loss. Um, these tattoos, while they do have significance in certain cultural settings, they also are a way for people to honor um, ancestors or people who have passed. Women getting someone tattoos because their grandmothers never had the opportunity or their grandmother or great-grandmother was the last person in their family to have it, so they want to revive it. Um, and some people get them because they just represent their Samoan identity. They're a marking that's associated with the culture, but they might not have any ambitions or opportunity to perform the cultural practices that go with wearing the tatau. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot more in common, I think, that Samoan tattooing, while it's, it's put up as something sacred and certainly very important in Samoan society, it has a lot in common with what people expect and and get when they walk through a tattoo studio door in any city in the world. All these things about transformation, identity, healing, and um, dealing with some kind of inner need for yourself or your community. Sean, just in case um, folks don't have a visual for someone tattooing, can you share your, like a couple of slides from your um, PowerPoint? Okay, I'll do that now. Yeah. I think that would just be good. There's a, a common cultural test gen that I think you're going to talk about too, which is which is good. Can you see that? Is that visible? Yes, yeah, great. So these are the Samoan tattooing tools, um, and they're a big part of um, what helps people heal. I mean, you can get a Samoan tattoo done by machine but a lot of people gravitate towards the tools because they are that sort of tangible connection between past practices, um, heritage lost, things like that. But it's the, the use of tools are, are still very important. Here's another set. Um, they're, they're made from uh, turtle shell, boar's tusk and wood. Here's some modern tools is where they've started using um, metal just so that they, they can maintain good standards of hygiene and, and sterilization. And they've also produced commercial inks now. And these are ex the extensive body markings on men. It's called the pe'a. And you can see the woman, a tattoo on the legs, it's called the malu. And um, it's, a, it's a process that can spread over several sessions, over a couple, several days or several weeks, depending on the stamina 
of the of the tattooed person and the program of the, the tattooist. And just a few more images. You know, the, 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 these are the sort of tattoos that you see um, most public. And this is how they're transported through film, television. Yay! <laughs> Moana. Um, and these are some of the, the some some tattooists that were given Samoan tattooing titles. So you get to see how Samoan tattooing exists in the global milieu. This is myself. Um, I'm tattooed on my back. I don't wear the, the formal body tattoos because for me, they're not culturally appropriate. Once again, you can sort of see how the old style inspire some of these new new motifs and and um i think that's that's just a quick run through of of some of the images i have but it gives you a sense of um the technology and uh the extent the the extent of the markings on people's bodies is that good enough yeah that's great um i'm just uh trying to uh, can you um, press stop share, Sean, so we can see all the speakers again? Okay. Let's try and work out how to do it. It's okay. I should be able. I can probably. If you could do it, it might be. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, no, thank you so much. That I think that just gives people a little bit more of a sense too for that. Um, I think Lisa might. Um, well, we we have a few um, follow up questions for things that the speakers have already said. So I might just pop in quickly with um, a few of these questions before we move on to our next big question. Um, the first question was for Sharky and Nancy is asking, can you say some more about the start of tattooing in the 1800s in the US? What group or groups, what, what images? Oh, uh, so Thomas Edison made what would become and be patented as the tattoo machine in, I think it was 1867. And then tattooer Samuel Riley came in and tweaked it to the coil machine that you see today, and I believe that was in 1891-ish. <laughs> uh, but essentially, that's where the sound of that ratty-tat-tat machine that you hear now, that's where that began as far as American traditional tattooing. Clearly, it existed far beyond that. Um, and the group of tattooers that I come from you know, our lineage is passed directly from that. So Samuel Riley begats Charlie Wagner. Charlie Wagner begats Stony St. Clair and uh, you know, the Moskowitzes. The Moskowitz begat Ron Lopez family tattooing. Pichia Quinto, all these guys begat John Farrick begats me. So it's like this full, when people speak of American traditional tattooing and that lineage, that's really what we're talking about. So those images that those guys did, which are all from old carny artwork, old, if it was on a cigarette label, essentially all they did was like rip off old stuff from movies and TV and turn it into very loose, simple, simplified drawings that could be tattooed on the skin, pack in the black, a little bit of color, boom. That's what an American traditional tattoo is. That's why the subject matter is usually eagles, ladies, tigers, it's stuff that you would see at the circus or if you went to war, you know? It didn't start right. to transform them to later. <laughs> <laughs> Got all those. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you should, you should. <laughs> and we just have one more question that I just might pop in, which was for you, Mark, which was, someone said, I might have missed this, but do you have any tattoos and why or why not? I think everybody has admitted that they have, all the panelists have said that they have tattoos, except for you. So I think that's why they're asking that. I don't. Um, and that um, has been probably conscious and unconscious, but part of what my life has been as a photographer is to witness at some distance. And I consider that important 
just to preserve some clarity in the images I make. So if I crossed that boundary, I no longer would have that place to stand and witness. So I need to preserve that. And I really value that. And I've done that with not just tattoo as a subject, as many other subjects. I photograph prisons, but I've never been incarcerated yet. And, uh, <laughs> and any other number. But I, it, it just recalls something that John Lenz, who's a tattooist in Youngstown, Ohio, um, he and his wife, Debbie, have worked together for 50 years. And I, I spent the weekend with John making photographs. And at the end of the day, a very long day, he stood next to me and said, our place in this world is to witness without judgment. And I have carried that um, with me as a powerful way of making images of those who come before my camera. That's it. Well, um, I, we, we have more questions coming into the Q&A and we will, we will get to um, those um, as we continue, but um, we wanna get back to some more questions to the panelists um, that Lauren and I have put together. And so following up on the, the question around motivations. So, um, so we've, we've heard about what motivations can be. Um, someone has made a decision to get a tattoo um, I, I'd like to hear you talk about the, um, what are some of the creative and technical considerations that go to working in the medium of ink and skin? Um, and this is, this is going to be a, a two part question. So, um, I guess first, um, let's kind of address that, that, um, that as far as, as aware of tattoo and tattoo artist, um, what are, what are some of those technical things that need to be discussed? Well, <laughs> um, so without taking up five hours, uh, essentially the most important thing to us when we do a tattoo is that it fit the shape of the body and the wearer. Those are two different things. So essentially if you break your body down into parts, it's just a bunch of triangles and ovals and circles, right? So we always wanna make sure that we're filling in those spaces appropriately. And then when we think about the wearer, that's when we're talking about the difference between, like you were saying, Mark, a gentleman who comes in who has a full body suit, retires and wants their face tattooed. The answer is yes. If you are 19 years old and you have your very first credit card and you want me to put fuck the world on your throat, the answer is no. So those are the types of things and those are extreme versions there's very like gray line versions of that that go on every day and it's hard to have that conversation with people because they feel like i'm their conduit so i have to do whatever they ask and i don't uh but you have to kind of talk people off the ledge very often into what is going to be the most appropriate for them as time passes the things that you want when you're 18 are never what you want when you're 45 so you have to kind of be judge jury and executioner on that Well, Sharky, the, the other piece of that, or a different take on that, is when I began uh, fascinated with what Nick was doing, um, I don't think there was a tattooist who would tattoo above the collar or below the cuff of anyone who came into the shop. I think that right. was an absolutely unwritten and enforced rule, and no one imagined ink emerging beyond, but it has taken over in some significant unusual ways. Yes, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I was taught, it took me forever to get my own hands tattooed. I, you know, my mentors wouldn't even do it for me. I had to beg for it. Uh, but we're taught not to tattoo hands, necks, or faces unless it's like they are fully tattooed. And I mean, till the day, Lyle died without, this man's body was completely tattooed but it stopped at his neck and it stopped at his hands because he liked to put on a suit and be totally incognito. Like he thought that that was the slickest, most appropriate way for a person to be. So it's very new the past maybe 20 years where it's becoming somewhat socially acceptable to have like an ice cream cone on 
on your cheek. <laughs> That's like a real tattoo on a real person who's very famous. Uh, things are changing. Sean, did you want to speak to that at all? I'm, I would be interested to hear what kind, like, how, what kind of technical considerations are thought about with the Samoan tattoos. Technical considerations, I think um, I've touched on in terms of this technology around the Samoan tools. And there's a real um, awareness and a sense of responsibility to um, make sure people don't pick up any infections, that the, that the procedures are, um, are safe. And uh, there's, uh, in the last year, even in New Zealand, there, there have been fono or special meetings of tattooists, someone tattooists, to discuss the regulations and how they can protect themselves and their clients um, in, in the work. Because people have um, you know, suffered skin infections, people have died from um, not taking care or following uh, the, t the instructions of the tattooists here in New Zealand. And those cases are well documented um, in medical journals and online. So you can read up on that. Um, but there's also um, cultural uh, preferences as well. People will be tattooed in groups of usually two or more. And part of that is to support the, the, each other but also it gives an opportunity for the tafunga to, or the tattooist to stagger the work. So while, um, while one person's resting, the other person gets tattooed. So there's, there's all these kinds of ways in which they manage their work um, and just uh, spread it out over a period of time. Um, those are the sort of main, the main things, but uh, you know, pain, Pain management and just client management. It's really interesting to see how different tattooists approach that aspect of the work and how they handle the psychology of, of the patients because it's quite an intimidating um, undertaking to get such extensive markings. So that, as a researcher and as a historian, it's been interesting to see how those techniques have, have changed over time, but it's also been quite difficult to find accounts of that work. I think we'll definitely come back to the idea of the pain because we already have a couple questions in the Q&A about that. So okay. if some of the other speakers have comments on that, we'll, 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 we'll come back to that. Yeah, and, and just and to kind of follow up there, um, which I, and I did want to address the, the question that someone had about pain. Um, but so, and Sharky, you did, you did allude to this, but um, kind of the, the next part of this question is um, how much of, um, how much is it the tattoo wearing coming in with a clear idea? How much of is it, how much is it collaboration between the wearer and the artist? Um, you know, are most of these decis decisions done um, collaboratively? Um, and then to one of our questions we had directly, more directly to Sharky, which um, uh, one of the audience members has asked too, if you could address the pain. Um, so, if someone comes to you and they have a specific part of their body where they want the tattoo, do you have a real serious conversation with them about this is gonna hurt much more in this part of your body than it would if you were to do it someplace else? Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so the first part of the question is, is it a collaborative experience? The answer is, it feels like it to you, but it's not. <laughs> um, I'm going to make you feel like it is as much of your idea as possible. But essentially, anybody who comes up with an idea to get tattooed, it has to be tattooable. So I have to make it tattooable. So, you know, the thing that tattooers hate to hear the most is, my cousin draws and they drew this. Like, that's a red flag. I'm like, oh, cool. It's going to look crazy. So what you have to do is like this real fine line between kind of being a detective when you're having the consultation and find out what is like the meat and bones of this tattoo that they really want you know because they're like i want a tree and all the leaves will be pictures of my kids and all of their birthdays and the colors it's like oh i hear kids i heard that and i heard names so it's like oh so you want some strip and you just dial it down so 
it is collaborative, but at the end of the day, you need to pick a good tattooer who has a good head on their shoulders, a good portfolio. You'll end up with an amazing tattoo, no matter what you ask for. And as far as the pain is concerned, I tell my clients not to concern themselves with that because if they are, then they're already hoarding their experience. They're going to hurt. There's no way around it. Certainly there's places that are more sensitive than others, but if you walk into the experience all hopped up on the idea of how much it's going to hurt, then it's going to hurt. But if you take into consideration the fact that this is a passing thing, it's going to end, it's just something I have to go through, you almost don't feel it at all. We're hanging out, we're talking, there's music playing. You know, pain isn't even real. It's just a receptor to your brain to tell you that something's going on. You can, you can turn that off with the right kind of mentality. So that's usually the way I approach it. And I, you know, if they're in there getting super sensitive, people cry, there's all this kind of stuff that goes on, we stop. You stop, you gather yourself, we go back in, if you can't, we stop and you come back another day. Usually when you say you got to come back another day, they stop crying. <laughs> Usually ends it really quick. John, do you, you want to speak, speak to that maybe? Uh, Experience in, in the collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I think when I, like I think the first tattoo that I had, I had more of an idea of what I wanted. And then as time went on, like, I basically will just go to an artist that I respect and be like, this is what I'm thinking. They'll draw something and then I get it tattooed. And it's kind of that simple. Like I don't have, and to me it's more, it's become more about getting this tattoo artist's art on me more than usually what the tattoo represents. And I mean, sometimes the tattoos are meaningful, but really sometimes you know, they're not. And it is just more fun and for an experience. And for me, again, I'm just like, just trying to fill up. <laughs> and as far as pain goes, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I used to be tattooed for five hours and it would be fine. And as I've gotten older, it's just, it really sucks. <laughs> I don't really like it anymore. I thought that having a kid would make me just like totally immune to the pain of tattoos and not the case. I'm really bummed about that. Hey, Lauren. Yes. There's a uh, tattooist in Columbus, Ohio named Marty Holcomb, uh, a, a good guy um, who talked about this a little bit. And he said, because um, one of my assistants, Heather Malt, interviewed him for me. He said, I need you as much as you need me. So that's the relationship that tattooists have to face every day. They need that oh, it's the moment. Yeah. I mean, Shar Sharky needs that. This, this is like an unfulfilled every day. I need more of this. And so that's the relationship that you have to deal with and, uh, and make work in some way. Yeah, I've been, um... I've been tattooed by, I think it's six or seven tattooists now. And um, in terms of collaboration between client and the artist, I remember getting a big piece done across my shoulders and uh, I went up to the, the, the tattoo artist who was a Cook Islander from the Cook Islands, which is another archipelago in the South Pacific. I went to the wall of his studio and I said, I quite like that design. Would you be able to do something like that? This was his own work. He had photographs of his own work and other clients. I pointed to a little design. I said, I quite like that motif. He leans in and he goes, hmm, I like it too. Then he looks at me and he goes, but it doesn't mean you're going to get it. And I've never chosen any tattoo that's on my body. I've, it's not really ever been a collaboration. You, do, you just don't tell in the cultural setting the tattooists how to do their work. So I've never chosen anything. So those long body pieces you see on the legs of men and women, there's a structure that's, that is similar to every single client, but the way they fill in that structure is up to the tattooist. And in our societies and cultures, you don't tell the tattooist what you want. I mean, there are exceptions to that rule from time to time. You might give them a, a general briefing, but that, that's it. And I've never chosen a tattoo. Um, the other question around pain, 
you've seen the photographs I shared of those tools. They look scary, but I actually find them a lot easier to deal with where they tap them with a, a mallet and they go into your skin. I find tattooing machines a lot more difficult to tolerate. And um, I think the longest session I've done is about nine hours and um, it was hard going. Whereas with the, uh, with the hand tools, I think the longest session was about three and a half. And that, that was far easier to tolerate and to cope with. So um, those are just, yeah, just some thoughts on the, the pain question and the collaboration question. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I want to return to a little bit of what Mark kind of suggested earlier about um, like where people, like what areas are considered like no tattoos in those areas or, or not and how that's changed over time. Because certainly even just some comments on our Facebook event for this webinar showed that tattoos still trigger certain assumptions and responses. And so we just wanted to ask, like, why do you all think that tattoos trigger those responses? Is there a history there? Why do you think that they're not considered art? You know, it was really interesting. Somebody on the Facebook event was like, who doesn't consider tattoos art? And then other people were like, oh, never. You know, so I, I think it's just, um, I, I mean, you all already spoke a little bit to how that perception is changing, but I would love to hear more more about that and why you think it's changing, um, why you think it triggers the kinds of responses that it sometimes does. Tattooing is the last lowbrow folk art that exists today, okay? And, and I like it like that, and I, think that because there's a lot of now there's like art students doing tattoos now and that has what has crossed the bridge into people having these conversations where they're like, like is this a high art you know uh, tattoos are still being done in garages you know it's it's the working man's art and I kind of want to keep it that way I, I like that it's that we're able to have conversations like this because it is at least now we're getting into these conversations about how truly technical it is and how much effort and talent it takes to produce them. But I often fear that if tattoos are like shot up into this realm of high art, then, you know, working class dad, electrician isn't going to want one anymore. And that's, that's who I want to work with because I feel like I have the most meaningful experiences with that client versus the client that's just got five thousand dollars at their disposal and wants like this crazy thing you know like I not that I don't enjoy those experiences but I enjoy the experience with the everyman much more and I think that tattooing will always speak to those groups of people yeah I think why tattooing will never be like high art or I mean I guess some tattooers could be considered fine art but the high art there like there's a level of intellectual pursuit right like there's like people want to talk about paintings in a museum like in a way that i don't think that tattooing needs to ever be talked about i don't you know i think that people can relate on a level like where it's more it's humans it's you know connecting with people it doesn't have to be this like intellectual like well maybe it was this, maybe it would, you know, it's more real than that. Don't you think that tattoo aspires to be artful? I've met a lot of folks who began their careers um, as art teachers, MFA art students, sculptors, printmakers, um, and that ends up showing up in, in the way they work and, and the clientele that they have. Um, but I think the one thing that keeps tattoo from becoming uh, museum quality, if you will, is that there's really no way to capture it. My photographs don't capture it. Tattoo isn't stopped time. It's a performance. It's something in public or not in public. It's a glimpse. It's a glance. 
It's dance. It's a prize fight, but it's not something you can put on a pedestal. So it's really a difficult medium to say this is tattoo, even though artists make it happen today. A lot of fine artists have moved in to try and carve out their own little turf yeah. amongst the folks who 50 years ago um, would, would resist any intrusion of artist into the domain of tattoo. That wasn't where the early pioneers were, th were thinking they wanted to go. If we can only get this into the museums, it'll really be great. Right. I, I, that's just not happening. And it's not gonna exactly. happen, I don't think. Photographs don't do it. Um, movies don't do it. How, there's just no way to transform that experience into a common public domain, I think. The history of tattoos can be captured very beautifully in museums. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. It was, you know, before Lyle died, the last thing he did was have a huge museum expo, which was the largest in ever in tattoo history in San Francisco. And that was like as close to I I've ever come to it being a museum experience. And even that was like really weird. It was just a bunch of tattooers walking around getting drunk, but we were like in a museum, we're like, oh, I can't be touching. So it's, it's still strange. It's happening. You can go see an Ed Hardy exposition if you like. There's some really amazing stuff, but like Mark is saying, tattooing is too alive. It's too living and breathing to be just put in a box. I love yeah, that. I mean, a lot of those ideas, I work in a museum and I've just curated a show of Samoan tattooing and photography. And we really struggled. It was a tight time frame to, to do the exhibition, but we struggled to get all the dimensions of Samoan tattooing into the exhibition that makes it such an interesting subject for me. Um, the photography was amazing. We had four, four people present the images and um, I wish I'd taken a photo now to show you, you guys. But um, I mean, when I, when I was listening to you speak, what is most compelling for me personally are the stories around t tattooing. And when I see all these shows on Vice TV and the documentaries, the formal qualities, I mean, I love a Japanese bodysuit like a lot of people do, but what is more compelling and what carries these docos are the stories of the artists, um, the stories of the people who wear the markings. And that's the most compelling thing. Um, aside from the formal qualities of the, the, the artwork itself. So, I mean, how you bring that together on the floor in a way that has mass appeal, I think is still a challenge. But, you know, the connoisseurs and the tattoo artists and the people of the tattooing community will love a show like the one I heard about relating to Lyle Tuttle, where you have tattoo flash and machines and the technology. Um, but yeah, different audiences for different things, just like there is for contemporary art and other forms of fine art, I, I think. Um, there's some crossover, but I think the, the, the mass appeal is still limited. Before we go on to our final sort of moderator question, um, we did just have a comment from um, a participant who said that they attended the Museum of the Old and New Art in Hobart, Tasmania where a gentleman with his back tattooed was on display and he sold his tattoo to someone for $250,000 and the buyer would collect his skin when he passed. So it does, I just thought that was fascinating and had to share it as part of this like commodification display of tattoos. Um, thanks, Lar, Lar, for sharing that. Really appreciate it. It's really interesting. Um, but off to you, Lisa, for the final question. All right, yeah, so our final moderated question for everyone is, um, what is the most unique, innovative, or unusual tattoo you've either seen, created, or have? I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing crazy or you know, boring over here. <laughs> I, it's so hard for me to answer that question because it is a question that people ask tattooers every day mm -hmm. and we hate answering it and usually when people ask it I ask them why why <laughs> why do you want to know what the weirdest tattoo is what they're really doing is they're fishing for a weird story they want to hear a story about someone passing out in your shop or something that's really what they want to know uh, and what I like to just say is 
whatever the weirdest thing that you can think of in your head, someone has a tattoo right on their chest. I can guarantee it. <laughs> That's the answer. I think that's interesting that what you're saying about like the motivation for asking that question, because I think for Lisa and I, and Lisa, feel free to chime in and say, no, that's not why we ask this question. <laughs> but um, I think I was thinking about, you know, we talk a lot in the world of museums and art about innovation and how artists are innovating and how innovation is an important feature of contemporary art forms. And so I think I, I was curious about the answer to that question to hear sort of how tattoo artists are innovating in different ways. But, um, but I mean, maybe there is some sort of like, you know, weirdness factor there too underneath the surface. <laughs> yeah, innovating is, I mean, I think it's the opposite for a lot of us in tattooing as far, like we're not trying to change the wheel. In fact, we just want to keep the wheel spinning as it is. The more you try to change tattooing, the more you tend to mess it up. It's kind of already perfect. And unless human skin starts doing something totally different, there's not much that more that you can innovate within that field. So you can just, you know, we're in a space where now we can look at photographs of tattoos that were done a long time ago. And you can look at that and go, hey, to some 75 year old tattooer, you remember when that guy did that tattoo? What size liner was that? And they tell you and you look at it and you go, oh, all right. Note to self, don't do that. That we don't want to innovate. In fact, we just want to like follow the the road that's already been paved so that it just continues to look correct on the skin. Well, and I, I feel like Sharky, because you have a history in American traditional, and that's basically like what I am covered in and also appreciate the most when it comes to like Western Americanized tattooing is that what's sort of interesting now is there is like innovation in tattooing. You know, people are, you know, using more watercolor or, you know, fine lines and things that I'm gonna be really interested to see in like 20 and 30 years, how they hold up. It's not new though. It's just the first time people are seeing it. Fine line has been around for hundreds of years. Watercolor has been around for probably close to 80, 90 years. People are just now seeing the flow of it. We have seen it as tattooers. We know it already. That's why we're always like, don't get watercolor tattoo. <laughs> you tell people not to do it, and they're like, I'll do it in any way. And it's like, see you in five years for that touch up, no problem. <laughs> With um, Samoan tattooing, you might get the impression that it's re remained unchanged for hundreds of years and it's passed down from apprentice to apprentice and it's done in the same way all the time but what the history that Sebastian and I discovered uh, reveals is that it has um, had moments of innovation and change very subtly so back in the 1800s it, there would have been a lot more black big patches of black and in the early 20th century there's more elaboration and extra lines and things put in to to make it more decorative um, today there's one particular Samoan tattooist, whenever I see an Instagram pic where he's put in a lot of black, I, I write, bring back the black, because I want us to go back to the big black chunks within the work. And he always laughs because the general public want to keep adding more decorative detail. And it's, it, and it's sort of interesting to see how innovation and change can, it may be cyclical. We may go back and revive things or or just keep pushing it in another direction. So um, yeah, that's just a, an angle from Samoan tattooing. Well, well, carrying on with what Sean just said, um, 40 years ago, when I met Nick here in Pittsburgh, um, tattooing was secretive and unshared and private and tattooists weren't generous about letting anybody else know what they were doing, how they were doing it, um, what was going on, but as I watched conventions explode, the transformation of energy and information is was just profound because tattooists walk up and down the aisles and see internationally what's really going on in, in many ways. So it's the, the phenomenon of of that has I'm sure changed the practice. I know when when Nick had an apprentice named Tux, uh, he taught Tux on 
only when Tuck said, I promise I won't tattoo here, and he went to Baltimore. So you have to go 300 miles away to start your business because it was that turfy at the time. But that turf is gone. <laughs> there is no turf. There's shops in Richmond, as you said, <laughs> every third storefront. So, you know, that's where it's gone. Great. Well, um, I think this is continuing to just be so interesting. And I'm glad that we have some time to get to some of these um, really wonderful um, audience questions. So a couple of people have um, touched on this idea of cultural appropriation and this idea of almost like copyright issues with tattoos and I think especially maybe Sean, the, the first part of this question is directed to you about people appropriating, you know, some like sacred Samoan um, designs. And I think it sounded earlier like you had kind of, you were alluding to the, this idea that people, that some of the most prominent artists had gathered in order to kind of figure out how to address that. Um, can you speak a little bit about that topic? And, and I, I also just, it, looked like somebody else had also bring, brought up this idea about tribe and that that term uh, in relationship to, to tattooing and sort of like where that comes from and are there are there issues with that too? It's a really live debate here in the South Pacific and no doubt elsewhere, um, especially in regards to indigenous tattooing forms. It's, it's, it's a huge conversation. Um, even as recently as the last 48 hours, um, there's been debates in my Facebook news feeds amongst local um, Maori artists around people appropriating their designs and um, claiming to be experts or having certain knowledge uh, around Maori tattoo patterns. And uh, another, another thread of um, debate is coming up around people in another country um, reproducing tattoos, Māori tattoos of someone's, off someone's back on garments and selling them and not, um, you know, not acknowledging the artist, let alone the wearer, and who knows where the, the funds go. Um, I get a lot of questions when I talk to people uh, about Samoan tattooing and people asking about appropriation and non-Indigenous Samoan artists working with the, the motifs. And it's really hard to know what to say to people. Um, and the, the relationships are complex, even historically. Um, Samoans have been tattooing non Samoans for 300 years. So it's like, how do we unravel and, and bring these, these threads together at the right points? And I just say to them that um, right now, the most important thing you can do is not worry about trying to bring Samoan tattooing back from the world because it's just on the internet, it's everywhere. You can never retrieve it. The best way to protect your art form is to preserve, acknowledging that these these things change as well, preserve those cultural contexts where it has most meaning for you and look after them and just keep those contexts alive because you're never going to um, stop somebody copying line for line the Samoan tattoos on a Samoan wrestler or um, something they've seen on a sports star on television you're, or in any photograph on the internet. You're never going to stop people from copying them and using them inappropriately or wearing them on the wrong part of the body. So focus on what has many for you and try and protect that. And, um, you know, that's just a global situation. And if it's not Samoan, it could be Inuit, it could be, you know, Filipino styles, whatever. Um, very difficult to manage. Um, so, the next question, actually, two people have asked about um, the idea of tattoos being permanent, um, these, these permanent, um, permanent markings on the body and addressing the permanence as well as the regret. Um, and for those of you <clears throat> who have tattoos, if, um, if there is regret or even if there's just to talk about possibly the shift in in feelings regarding the tattoo 
That's tough. <laughs> uh, I think that, well, you know, for most states, you need to be 18 years or older. And at that age, you should understand the idea of permanence. And then like what I said earlier, if you go to an, a reputable enough artist, they will steer you in a direction to make sure you're not making some vast mistake. Uh, but other than that, it's on you. You know, you have to govern your own soul. Uh, I don't have any tattoos I regret, regardless of how silly they are. You know, they are a marker in time. And I look at them and I'm like, yeah, that was, that was me, you know, and I'm fine with it. Other people uh, don't feel the same way. And that's great because doing cover-ups is a part of my job. So I'm okay with it either way. <laughs> And Genevieve, you and I talked about this on the phone a little bit, and yeah. we kind of had a similar answer about, about regret. Totally similar answer. I mean, I, you know, people always ask about tattoos. They'll, you know, like clients of mine, they're like, well, you know, I really am thinking about getting my first tattoo. And my response is like, okay, but you really should think about it a lot. If you don't have any tattoos, the one tattoo that you're going to get is gonna really stand out, especially if you end up regretting it. You know, being covered in tattoos, sure, there's a, I have like really silly tattoos. Do I regret them? No, they just blend in so it doesn't really matter. Like, if you have one tattoo that you end up regretting, like that's, that's a lot harder. So I think, you know, when people are just like, they see, you know, somebody like me covered in tattoos and they're like, man, I really want one. And it's like, well, do you though? Because you might just end up, you might really regret that if you only want one tattoo, like for the experience. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, I, um, I, don't, I don't know if this is, uh, this is a regret story, but I think it was my first or second tattoo I got done, it was on my back. And I, I was in, in um, the Netherlands, and I was staying at a house where um, the, both people were quite heavily tattooed. I complained and moaned a little bit. I said, oh, I don't really like that back piece because it's not symmetrical and the line's a bit crooked and it's not the same as the other side. And the guy just looked at me like I was some big baby and just said, Sean, that's tattooing. And I went, oh, yeah. And you've got to realize it's a handcrafted thing. And there's going to be crookedness and things that don't quite work out. That's tattooing. And it was a little bit of a, okay, moment for me, you know. And um, I've got lots of crooked lines. <laughs> and things that match and, and little blemishes and bleeds and things yep. or areas where it's blown out that's that's tattooing that's part of the life of the artwork and the life of you know the my skin that's my skin story so um but i was really grateful very early on to have that pointed out to me bluntly awesome. um somebody asked about sensitivity to blue dye and um if that's something that I guess Sharky you have run into um, or not? Yeah, it's usually not blue. It's usually red. Uh, but yeah. anybody anybody can be susceptible to any kind of infection with the pigment. Uh, that is why you sign a consent form before we get started. Uh, we are inserting a foreign body into your living, breathing, moving body, and. 99.99999% of the time, nothing's going to happen. But when you do have a reaction, it's going to be something very subtle. We're talking bumps, maybe losing the color and having to get it redone. Like your arm isn't going to fall off. It's not going to be anything like that. Uh, so it, it's subtle, but it, it can happen. You know, it, it's, it's the unknown. I, yeah, I'll kind of like jump in. And again, I don't know if this is like the one kind of, tricky thing about tattoo ink is that it's not really like regulated that much and it hasn't been in the past 15 years in the states so a lot of tattooing you don't really know the ingredients sharky would you agree with that half yeah because they have really clamped down on yeah. the pigments and they want to know the batch numbers so it is regulated but we are still allowed to make our own pigments and I would never tell you what I put in it so you're right in that respect yeah so I mean I'll have certain like certain tattoo like certain colors that get raised like 
just for no reason sometimes. And that, you know, it could be like an allergy because of weather or the pigment or something, but it's not like it is bothersome. Yeah. There's, a, there's another question that's probably interesting here from Megan who, um, hey Megan, she was an intern of mine. <laughs> it was the same Megan Smith. Um, so she says more for tracking Sean, although knowing a little bit of background about the speakers, I think this really goes to everyone. Do you make art in other media outside of tattooing? Um, did you arrive at tattooing after painting, drawing, sculpting, et cetera, beforehand or not? I was kidnapped. I was forced to tattoo. <laughs> I never had a dream or a, this, that, there's no tattooing love story. I wasn't like, it's what I wanted to be when I grow up. But I found myself in a position uh, where I was working in a shop as the floor manager. And I was working around some of the most incredible tattooers in New York at the time. You know, Hillary uh, White worked there. Michelle Tarantelli worked there. I was working under Vinnie, Vinnie Signorelli. It was like, this and uh, Benny Smalls, like all of these tattooers have gone to be these great tattooers and it was infectious. And I was already very heavily tattooed and involved in the scene in that way. So it kind of stumbled in that way. Um, but before that I was a musician and a seasoned bartender. So it was like that. so creative, but it wasn't art, uh, you know, with drawing pictures and through tattooing, my artistry has evolved and now I paint and I, you know, carve prints. And I, I mean, I, my ability to become an artist has happened through tattooing. It wasn't the other way around. And for most traditional tattooers, that is the story. You know, the technical aspect of the job was learned first and you were taught how to draw tattoos. It's harder to teach a tattooer who already knows how to draw really exceptional stuff and then dial it back and be like, okay, now you got to draw it like a tattoo because you can't tattoo it like that. That's harder to do. So I think my story probably mirrors many traditional tattoos. So Genevieve, I know you, you practice, I mean, I can, this is maybe a subject for an, another art and life program, but I would consider makeup another art form. Um, but what, uh, do you practice any, do you work in any other media? I mean, I grew up and I was artistic. Um, you know, I, my main focus in sort of like late high school into college was, was art and many different mediums. Um, and then it, I became a hairdresser, which sort of came naturally because I had been doing hair, you know, for years. And it is just kind of a different type of medium. You know, you're literally still painting, you're creating like visible shapes and yeah, makeup as well. It's like, you know, I have the, you know, the, the face as a canvas usually. So it, 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 it satisfies like my artistic side in my career. I feel really lucky. Mark, have you always been a photographer? I have. Do you work in other media as well? Um, rarely. Um, mostly tangential to uh, photographs, doing photo etching or using photography in some other ways to uh, enter printmaking just a little bit. But uh, I've never found photography to be, that I found the edge, that I've come, come to the limits. It's always expanded to uh, let me chase my interests completely. So it's been good in that way. It just keeps moving, as did with my interest in tattoo, which is still mysterious and unfulfilled and forever will be <laughs> just the way it is. Sean, are you an artist as well as a curator? I mean, I, um, you know, I, I, I can play guitar and do stuff like that. Uh, I, I guess that uh, I did have ambitions to be a graphic designer. Um, and before I got the job at the museum, I was actually preparing a portfolio um, to go to design school because I thought my Bachelor of Arts was just had been a waste of time, so I couldn't get work. Um, but since I um, you know, entered the museum field, I just decided I'm going to commit to curating, writing, and researching. My wife bought me um, a tattooing kit probably 10 years ago, 
um, and it's still in its box. Um, and it was, it was everything. It was like a couple hundred dollars worth of gear that I needed. You know, everything's still in its box because I just thought that you've got to commit to a craft like tattooing and the people I met, they weren't part-timers. They were, it was their life. And I thought that I'd got to the point where um, curating and researching and writing, that was going to be my life. So um, I live vicariously through my many tattoo artist friends and, and, and tattooed friends. Um, and it's, it's, it's been very fulfilling. We just have a, wait, Lisa, are you? I can't hear you. Oh. There you go. Um, all right, so one more, two more questions we have here from the audience. Um, this question asks, could you all talk about the difference in representational or narrative tattoos versus more abstract tattoos? Don't get narrative tattoos. <laughs> you mean like, I don't understand the question. You mean like a lot of lettering? Is that what they're asking versus something that, that is just a, an image? I would say, so if the person who asked the question is still on, it's anonymous. Um, if you could elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, maybe if that person could um, ask their question with a little more specificity and we'll, we'll go on because we, we have one other person who says, what happens to a tattoo when your skin gets old and wrinkly, which is a concern that a lot of people have. And I think Jonavi had a quick response to that. Jonavi, do you want to chime in about that one? Well, you know, when you get old, your skin gets wrinkly. So you're going to have tattooed wrinkly skin. At least it's colorful. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like wrinkly old skin isn't going to be pretty anyways. So I think tattooed wrinkly skin is going to be way cooler. <laughs> Love it, love it. Um, a colleague said maybe the attendee was asking about, um, oh yeah, here we go. We said narrative being more a representational versus abstract. So do you all prefer one or the other or how are you feeling about that? Tattooers prefer straightforward tattoos. We often tell our clients that when you attach too much meaning to your tattoo, then you're losing it. Like, then now it's time for you to buy a painting for the wall. It needs to be really straightforward because your tattoo needs to be strong, solid. I need to be able to tell what it is across the street. And I can't do that if we're going to tell you the story of how you moved somewhere in a van when you were five. Like, it, they tell the story, like, they'll tell me the most elaborate story. And I'm like, so you want a flower? You know, like that's pretty much how we do it. So I think most tattooers try to stray from the abstract, get to something that's more concrete. Although there is this, you know, this need and this call for people to have more unique tattoo designs and they want them to be abstract and weird. And that's cool. That's a scene all by itself. But I definitely am a tattooer that draws a real big line in between what I do and that side of tattoo. Anybody else want to comment on that? Um, this probably isn't a perfect fit and maybe it's completely inappropriate, but I met Ronald in Philadelphia um, maybe three or four years ago at a convention who had uh, tattoos of both his mother and father. And when he got the tattoos, he had taken both of their ashes and had the tattooist mix it with the ink. So when he talked to Heather, he said, I walk around as my parents' living urn. So where does that go, Sharky? <laughs> I'll do whatever you want. Just sign that consent form, baby. I've done it before. <laughs> Love it. Well, that's the end of our, those are the end of our audience questions, unless somebody chimes in with something really quickly here. Um, I just want to say this conversation has been so interesting. We've gone from like healing to searching to fun to transformation to performance to like connecting the past and the future and innovation. It's been so fabulous. 
Um, thanks to each of our speakers. If any of you want to say anything, um, a sort of a, a finale, feel, feel free. You know, I just want to say to anybody that's watching, if you're looking to get tattooed, to please do your research about the artist that you're picking the shop, especially right now as we're dealing with a global pandemic and we are slowly starting to reopen. It's highly important that you pick someone in a place that is using the highest protocols and procedures in order to make this dream happen for you. And to please be patient with your artists as we move into this new era of tattooing because whatever it used to be, sadly, it's not gonna be that anymore as we go through all of this. So just please be careful out there. I, nothing means more to me than tattooing and I would hate to see my livelihood die or be outlawed or something crazy because we're all not working together to procure it and be safe with it. Mm -hmm. So please, with this COVID, please do your research. Hey, you know what they say, cheap tattoos aren't good. Good tattoos aren't cheap. Yes. <laughs> that about most things, I think. We, but I would get definitely especially tattoos. <laughs> yeah. We do just have one last question, which I think might be a really good way to end, um, which somebody asked, what, ta what makes tattooing a spiritual experience for some people? I mean, maybe that's highly individual, but... What's wrong with that? For me, and I'll do be as quick as I can with it, um, it is always a more spiritual experience when I am doing the tattooing than rather when I'm getting it. Um, I pick up people's vibrations. There's blood being shed. There's always power in blood. I'm touching people. We're touching people. We are absorbing their energy, whether it's through their actual vibration or the words coming out of their mouth you know, and it's something that you carry, it's heavy. People are talking to you about death, they're talking to you about abuse, a trauma, it all gets stuck on us. So it becomes this very spiritual experience and our clients are always looking for us to heal them. Hmm. You, and it's something that requires, the, the amount of concentration that goes into that, I'm trying to coach you through your pain, coach you through your trauma, trauma make you sit still, pull a clean line, do the thing, let you have a bathroom break. There's so much going on in a tattooer's head. When the music's playing, it's, and there is a great spiritual weight that goes on with that. And it's unavoidable, whether you want to admit it or not, if you are a tattooer, like you can't deny the exchange that goes on between people. It's there, it's very real. Any of our other speakers want to? Yeah, you know, I think spiritual might be a bit strong for me, but um, definitely what makes has made tattooing memorable and valuable for me is just the connection. It's the connection with um, the ideas behind the markings, um, history, all those things you might read in a in a you know a new agey kind of book. They they actually some of those things are, are are really genuinely felt for for me in my experience. But it's also about the connection with the artist and the trust that you build with them. I think you're giving them something that when you allow them to mark your body, but they're also giving you their skill and their time and um, the benefit of the conversation. And um, I just think there's so much connection there that that makes it tattooing's memorable. I'm not just in the studio, but the time and place you are in your life. So, you know, maybe, well, now I'm changing my mind. Maybe it is a little bit spiritual. <laughs> there it is. I knew it was going to come back because you were like talking yeah. about that feeling. I was like, what's that feeling? There it is. Do you know you're a tattooist? <laughs> so yeah, I guess, I guess there's that element. Yeah. Maybe I just don't want to own up to it. Any other final thoughts before we finish? No. Thanks. Um, we had somebody said, thank you so much. I don't want it to end. And someone else has just said, this was excellent. Thanks so much to everyone. So thank you all to our speakers. A big virtual round of applause um, for all of your thoughts and input and sharing your experience with us today. And um, thanks to all of you attendees who asked amazing questions and uh, took time out of your Thursday evening or Friday morning to uh, join us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, this was great. This was super fun. Thanks, guys.
I learned a lot, I have to say. Thank Yay. You.